Welcome to the final day of the Sea Lice Online Conference. If you've been with us from the beginning, welcome back. If you're just joining us, then a special welcome to you. We're glad you're here. We have already had two wonderful conference days, and I'm excited about the final presentations today. My name is Amanda Vong, and I'm the head of the biotechnology department at Fisk Ehrling. I have a PhD in biomedical science from the University of Connecticut Health Center in the US, um, and my expertise is in immunology and experimental models of disease. Thank you, Amanda. <coughs> my name is Knut Simonsen. My background is from physical oceanography. I trained in at the University of Bergen. Uh, my principal position is in aquaculture-related ocean numerical modeling at the University of the Faroe Islands. The topic today is expanding options for integrated pest management, improved tools for a sustainable future. I've been looking forward to the presentation today. I think we will start just with a small delay. As in the previous two days, you have the opportunity to uh, ask questions to the speakers. Up to the right corner, you can write your questions. We'll please ask you when you are addressing the questions, start to mention the name of the speaker you want to address your question to. Now to the uh, presentations. The first presentation today is by veterinarian Chetl Rykus, his chief of external relations at Sinkaberg Hansen, the company in Norway. Chetl Rykus worked previously for the Norwegian Seafood uh, Federation, which is an organization of approximately 800 companies. Here he was responsible for managing and developing regulation for fish health and fish welfare. He has extensive experience working with both national and international authorities and organizations. Chelrikus has entitled his presentation in reducing sea lice through new production approaches. The screen is yours, Chelrikus. Thank you for being invited and for having this opportunity to provide some information about uh, how Sinkaberg Hansen aims at reducing sea lice through new production approaches. To start with, I would like to give you some key figures about the company. Sinkaberg Hansen is a family owned company with head office in Næresund municipality in the northern part of Trøndelag county. This is also where we have our main activity both at sea and on shore. We also have sea activities in the neighboring municipalities Lekka, Bindal and Brønnøy. Last year, the total revenue was around 2.5 billion Norwegian kroner. The company started in June this year slaughtering and processing in our new slaughterhouse next to the existing one at Marøya. The total construction cost for the plant was around 850 million Norwegian kroner. The slaughter capacity will be approximately 370 tons per eight hours. In addition, we have also recently started production in our new hatchery and small production plant, Svaberge. This plant is located in the eastern part of Næresund, next to Bindalsmolt. Construction costs uh, for Svaberge will be around 700 million Norwegian kroner, and the capacity will be approximately 6 million smolt per year. That comes in addition to the 4 uh, million smolt that we produce at Bindalsmolt. In implementing the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the Norwegian Seafood Federation has identified goal number 2, 3, 8, 9, 12, 13, 14 and 15 as most relevant for the Norwegian aquaculture. We see that all these uh, goals are relevant also for Sinka by Hansen. In addition, we have added goal number 7 related to affordable and clean energy. And we have also decided to have a particular focus on goal number 14, uh, where we have included fish welfare. By doing this, we will be able to put even more focus on welfare issues throughout our production. Although we last year had a death rate during production of approximately 4%, we see possibilities for reducing this figure and improve welfare, in particular during the ongoing period in the sea. 
Related to this, Sinka Bank has since uh, 2015 been monitoring migration habits of the salmon in river stocks in two rivers in Bindalsfjorden. Here we have both wild salmon, sea trout and arctic char. In this picture you can see uh, the Tusenfjorden, uh, Bindalsfjorden and the coastline on the top of the picture. You can also have an idea of the amount of fresh water from the rivers resulting in seawater with low salinity in the fjord for most of the year. This uh, mountain area here uh, produces a lot of snow during the winter and uh, rain water during the summer. Everything goes into uh, the Tusen fjord and creating a, a positive environment for producing salmon. The monitoring of the different river stocks of wild salmon has documented a sea migrating period lasting from April to mid-August. Consequently, there are hardly any wild salmon in the fjord from the beginning of August until mid-April the following year. Taking that, the salinity and the sea temperature into account, we hardly produce any salmon lice if we move the smolt into the sea late spring and then move the fish again to more exposed sites at the coast late winter for further on-growing. That will give us two to three months of coordinated following of the sites in, in this Tosen Fjord uh, area every year. In integration with nature, we therefore be, uh, will be able to reduce salmon lice uh, reproduction. We reduce handling of the fish and thereby also improve fish welfare. Additionally, this will be an important contribution to sustainable river stocks of salmonids in all the rivers in the fjord system. To summarize, we believe that the Bindal model will be an important production approach and a paramount measure in the basic biological prevention of limiting salmon lice reproduction in a sustainable production of salmon. That is why we have added ecology as an important preventive measure in the blue triangle. For further uh, new approaches and in the prolongation of implementing the Bindal model, Sinkerberg Hansen is testing out different semi-closed submerged solutions. It should be mentioned that we have already been testing such systems for some years and experiences made are included in further development of the systems. One semi-closed solution tested is the FISC system Sectus 10,000 to 30,000 that can be used in the Tusen Fjord or in more exposed locations. Experiences from the test period will create the basis for decisions on where this system can be relevant to use. Another system uh, that we currently are testing is the Atlantis model, where we cooperate with Aqua Group. We have established the company Atlantis Subsea Farming for this purpose. We have already made positive experiences and at location with both uh, submerged and traditional solutions, we see statistical differences in lice levels in favor of the submerged solutions. I recommend uh, that you check out the homepage of the Institute of Marine Research, where you will find reports uh, for, uh, from this project. Finally, I would also like to mention that we are in the process of testing a simplified solution of the Atlantis. Uh, this um, uh, solution looks very promising and uh, together with Atlantis and the FISC system Sertus, this will probably in the near future create an integrated part of our welfare focused salmon lice control strategy. In this picture, I have included the most important factors and issues to give an overall picture of the new production strategies and welfare related activity in Sinkabag Hansen. I would like to mention that. Uh, in Sinkabag Hansen, we have for several years had our own in-house health unit with veterinarians and fish health biologists. 
we consider that the knowledge that we have in-house and the day-to-day -day contact and discussions that we have with engineers and other parts of development, planning and production to be an important asset for both research, development and fish welfare. So by this, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Taitil, for your presentation. Our next talk is Modeling and Epidemiology, Managing and Evaluating Strategies, which will be given by Trondor Krakestein. He's an engineer educated at DTU Aqua in Denmark, where he completed his PhD last year, and Knut was Trondor's supervisor. Trondor now works as a researcher at Fiske Ehrling and is doing a postdoc focused on lice dispersal between the different fairies fjords and islands. Trondor. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for uh, the chance to speak at this conference. Uh, today I want to present how we here, through our work in FiscalLink, uh, want to improve uh, lice management and evaluate uh, strategies. So we can just start off with our main aim with our summer lice studies here at FiscalLink is to uh, provide knowledge that could aid in the achievement of uh, long-term control over uh, salmon lice or uh, even solve the salmon lice problem in aquaculture. We are, of course, mostly concerned with uh, fairies uh, aquaculture. So how we want to do this is uh, to uh, develop a salmon lice population dynamic model, which captures the dynamic of individual farms as well as uh, farm uh, networks. And if this step is achieved uh, and validated, we can start to evaluate and identify optimal management strategies, such as which is the best treatment threshold, uh, uh, optimal production length, how uh, uh, the length of the felling period, farm placement and the timing of when to put uh, smolts uh, into the sea and so forth. Uh, but today we're mainly going to talk about this step, develop a uh, summarized population uh, dynamic model. So if we start with a very simple lice uh, model, uh, here we have a differential equation uh, of population growth, where uh, internal uh, infection uh, plus external infection minus some mortality uh, is equal to population growth. Where uh, And internal infection is just the amount of larvae a farm produces to its own, while external infection pressure is both uh, a background infection from the environment, from other uh, uh, wild salmonid fish, and uh, the amount of larvae one farm uh, infects uh, another farm. So if we just briefly go through the dynamics, so if in internal infection is larger than uh, the mortality, we will end up in uh, some sort of uh, exponential growth. While if internal infection is less than mortality, we will uh, have uh, end up with an e equilibrium where equal amounts of larvae that come to the farm uh, also uh, die. So, uh, of course, uh, a real salmon lice uh, system is far more complex uh, than this. Uh, as we know, there are eight different stages uh, in the salmon lice uh, uh, life cycle. And the, the three first are planktonic and don't get affected by treatments uh, directly. And the other five uh, stages are also uh, uh, affected differently by different uh, treatments. And uh, further, uh, temperature uh, is a, a really big factor in, 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 in summarized population dynamics. And we wanted that to be incorporated di directly in our model. So we ended up having an uh, individual cohort-based model or agent-based, depends on how you look at it, where each cohort represents a number of lies, which is a sum of, as we spoke before, the external infection pressure, both from the environment and other farms, as well as the internal infection pressure, so the amount of larvae a, a farm produces to its own. Further, we have a bio-age, which is tracked, so when a cohort attaches to a farm, uh, uh, it has an initial bio-age of zero, and then uh, the bio-age follows uh, exactly or 
is identical to what Hampre et al. Uh, found in uh, 2019. So uh, this model is very flexible and allows uh, for a lot of opportunities. So if we look at just uh, an output from the model here, uh, simplified, so here we have just constant temperature and constant uh, internal and, and external infection pressure. And we have four, so here first here is just a simple example of how the growth is. So we have the calamus going up first. So we, on the y-axis here, we have uh, lice per salmon and the uh, x-axis we have uh, time. So in the simplified how the model works, it's that first the calamus go up, of course, and then the pre-adult and then adult female. And here we have separated adult female from egg-bearing adult females, which then start to take off uh, uh, later. And then we have three examples here. So first here we have uh, a treatment event where 90% of all stages on the farm uh, die off a uh, treatment event. So uh, we take a treatment event that is for a short amount uh, of time, uh, for example, a chem mechanical or chemical or bath treatment work in the same way uh, uh, model-wise. So here we uh, kill 90% of the stages and then uh, because we don't kill the planktonic larvae in the ocean or in the, in, in the surrounding environment, <coughs> they start to increase right away. And then uh, they become pre-adult and then adult and then uh, egg-bearing females shoot up again after some time. Uh, down here we have an example of uh, food treatment. In this example uh, is it's slice that works, that kills 5% of all stages uh, on the fish each day for 40 days. So here we see uh, uh, very different dynamics, even though uh, the long-term effect seems to be uh, almost uh, the same in these two examples. And uh, further, we have looked at uh, cleaner fish, uh, which is a fairly uh, under-studied uh, area uh, uh, in modeling or sample modeling. Uh, we here have an example of with 20% blend of cleaner fish, and they eat uh, 0 0.3 uh, mobile lice per fish per day. So they don't eat uh, the, the calamus in mobile calamus stages. And what we see here is that there has an effect, but we, what we also see is that uh, the timing of when you put the cleaner fish in uh, the net cages is, uh, has, is extremely important. So we first we tried to put it at 200 days and we almost didn't see any effect on the lice uh, levels. But if we put it 50 days before, we see uh, a lot larger effect. So uh, a lot of insights can be gained from uh, also just simplified uh, model runs like this. So <coughs> ideally, we want to uh, we want to estimate external and uh, uh, internal infection pressure based on hydrodynamic uh, simulations. However, this work uh, uh, still is on the way and, and we're uh, currently working on this um, uh, this part of the model. But we sort of took a shortcut and tried to estimate the external infection pressure and sort of indirectly internal uh, infection pressure through population growth rate based on uh, the lice uh, levels uh, or lice, uh, lice counts uh, that have been conducted in Faroe Islands since 2010. And here we found that External infection pressure varies greatly between farms in Faroe Islands. So here we see uh, 30 different farms and external infection pressure on the y-axis. <coughs> and it varies from uh, 0 0.002 to 0 0.1 lice per salmon per day, uh, which corresponds to uh, a farm site with a, a million uh, fish it will receive between 2,000 or uh, 100,000 larvae per day. Uh, so it just to give you an, uh, an example. Uh, we also looked at population growth rate, which also varied uh, significantly between various farm sites and uh, was uh, between 1.7 to 5.4% uh, per day. So <coughs> this is uh, very useful information also to have uh, on the back end when you are working with uh, these models. 
So if we just take a sh short side note and see how external infection pressure fits uh, within the physical uh, environment, we can do a uh, sort of a back of the envelope uh, equation or calculation here. So I said it varies a farm site with one million salmon uh, can get between 2,000 and 100,000 larvae per day. Uh, per day. And if we just take a rough example of the surface area of a farm and say uh, the current goes this way and uh, there are two cages there uh, which have are uh, approximately 50 meters in diameters, then we have a, a length of or a width of 100 meters and we say that all the lice enter within the top 10 meters, and then we have a surface area of around uh, 1,000 square meters. And a typical ferris farm has a mean current of around 5 centimeters per second, which uh, results uh, in a volume uh, of around 4.3 uh, million cubic meters per day. And if this is translated to uh, larvae per cubic meter, or infectious larvae per cubic meter, meter, we have yeah, some low numbers, 0 0.004, up to 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.02 larvae per cubic meter. And if we look at uh, Honoris numbers, uh, where they have uh, made a huge amount of, of trolling of lice larvae around the Faroe Islands, we see that uh, uh, the average number of cocopodites found per cubic meter is uh, 0.006, uh, and that was away from uh, quite a bit away from farming. And close to a farm, it was 0.02, and in the within, within a fjord, it was 0.075. Uh, so we can see that these values here are well, well within uh, range of each other. So it's a nice way to show that. Um, that the physical environment can also uh, correspond to our uh, external uh, infection pressure uh, estimates. Um, <coughs> next, I uh, just want to briefly show how this information I showed you can be used. Uh, so we did a pre preliminary trial of a ferris farm site where we estimated the external infection uh, or internal and external infection pressure as well as treatment uh, efficiency based on uh, or we fitted it with uh, samulized counts uh, or ferris samulized counts. And we took the average ferris temperature uh, or shelf temperature and used that to force the model. And down here we see an, uh, a model run uh, example where the model, uh, so we again we have lice per salmon on the y-axis, time on the x-axis and uh, the black line here shows the model run, or uh, the Samuelize model, and the red circles are uh, counts that have been done uh, by Fiskalink uh, in this production uh, cycle. So we see here there is a very good agreement between uh, uh, the model and uh, lice counts. Above here we see the pre-adults and adult male, uh, or mobile stages, and down here we see the adult female. So, uh, in principle, we could have modeled the whole production cycle just by knowing when they put the fish out, how uh, much of the fish uh, would put will be put out, and when and what treatments uh, they were uh, planning on doing uh, that in that production cycle. So, it. If trusted and validated, this can be an extremely valuable tool uh, in, in managing lice. So uh, what we want to do in, uh, the, or in the future, or what we are curr currently working on now, is to combine the hydro uh, hydrodynamic model. Uh, uh, we have some idea of uh, how that works in the Faroans, and combine it with a lice population dynamic model. And if that uh, step can be achieved uh, sufficiently, uh, we can start to uh, s answer these very important uh, questions as uh, the optimal treatment threshold, uh, what production length we, uh, is, is optimal, uh, how long should we follow, uh, where we should uh, place the farms and when we should place the farms or uh, put the fish out of the sea. Um, so. 
we see a lot of potential uh, in this uh, method of uh, tackling the uh, managing or management or strategies of uh, of lice uh, of lice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Trander. Good to see you again. Uh, from the Faroes, we'll go back to Norway, this time to southern Norway, to Professor Tor E. Horsberg at the Unit of Pharmacology at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Professor Tor Horsberg graduated as a veterinarian from the Norwegian School of Veterinary Science in 1983 and has since 1985 been working on and off his CS Biology and Control as a PhD student, then postdoc, associate professor, and then the last years as full professor. His title on the presentation today is Veterinary Medicines and Other Therapeutics. The screen is yours, Tor. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to give this uh, talk about medicinal uh, products in salmonid aquaculture. I will mainly be addressing uh, issues in Norway in uh, this talk. Medicinal products, they have actually been the cornerstone of uh, sea lice control for uh, as long as uh, salmonid aquaculture has been in uh, operation. Started out with uh, formaldehyde in the early 1970s, but were, was soon replaced by uh, organophosphates, metriphonate uh, in uh, Norway and the dichlorvos in Scotland. Later on, some of the ivermectins, uh, avermectins came along. Uh, in 1987, already ivermectin in Ireland and uh, some other countries. Uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, the top another topical disinfectant came along, then the pyrethroids and ketin synthesis uh, inhibitors uh, after that. So uh, you can see the timeline here. In uh, 1999, emamectin benzoate uh, was uh, introduced into the market. Uh, slice, very popular products in uh, all countries. And uh, it then uh, took uh, 17 years before uh, Lufenerum was uh, licensed in uh, Chile. And uh, this year, imidacloprid, an, uh, a neonicotinoid, uh, has recently been licensed in uh, Norway. So here you can see how the different uh, compounds group together. In yellow, the topical disinfectant. In gray, the uh, organophosphates. In red, avimectins. In uh, aqua, uh, pyrethrins and pyrethroids. In uh, pink, uh, ketin synthesis inhibitors. And in green, the neonicotinoids. So uh, basically, it's been quite... Uh, good uh, number of compounds with different modes of uh, action that have been uh, used and uh, partly still are used in uh, in some of the agriculture to fight the sea lice. The relative use of the different compounds has of course changed over time and it's uh, based on the when they were introduced. Uh, normally first a uh, big peak when uh, they were uh, introduced and then uh, uh, flattening out and declining. But some of the compounds, for instance, the organophosphates have regained uh, uh, popularity uh, since uh, 19, since uh, 2008, uh, as you can see. And uh, uh, they have their uh, turns ups and, uh, ups and downs over the years. So um, the treatment intensity has also changed uh, very much over the years. On this slide, you can see uh, how the situation is in Norway with the red line as the uh, number of tons of salmonids treated uh, per year with uh, one compound or the other, whereas the black line is the number of tons slaughtered per year. And you can see from 1992, which is uh, uh, presented on this graph, and until uh, 2007, uh, these lines follow each other quite uh, good. But uh, since uh, 2008 and uh, up until uh, 2015, uh, the red line, that is the number of salmonids uh, treated 
again with chemical agents against sea lice has increased dramatically. But then uh, there has been a steep decline <clears throat> in the use. And uh, the decline since uh, 2015 is not because sea lice are no longer a problem. It is because uh, the parasites have become resistant towards most of the agents uh, used. And uh, they cannot be controlled uh, by many medicinal products anymore. And of course, when they cannot be controlled, there is no uh, point in using the compounds. Since uh, 2013, we have in Norway had a program with uh, where the actually sensitivity of the parasites all along the coast have been uh, monitored through a surveillance program uh, initiated by the food safety authorities. And uh, here you can see the development uh, 2014 to 2016. Uh, you can see all compounds are uh, increasing in resistance, whereas there is a drop for most compounds since uh, 2017 and uh, onwards. The exception is emamectin benzoate. And this is actually quite in parallel with the utilization of the compounds, how much is used per year, as uh, uh, you could see from uh, from uh, the last graph. So when uh, the use is increasing, the resistance is increasing. Very simple. For emamectin benzoate, uh, there was a decline in the use uh, up until 2018, but uh, it uh, was then being used uh, more uh, in the last year, and that's reflected in this uh, this graph. Today's main strategy is, though, to use non-medicinal treatment options. And you can see here how it's uh, done. You have a net pen where the fish is crowded, and uh, they are then pumped uh, onto a well boat in this case, or a fleet, and then uh, subjected to mechanical or thermal treatments uh, to get rid of the parasites, and then uh, released into another cage. Since 2017, the majority of treatments have been with uh, non-medicinal uh, methods. You can see here the graph from 2012 to 2019, and, uh, and uh, clearly see that in uh, 2017, uh, the use of non-medicinal treatment options surpassed the use of uh, medicinal treatment options. These uh, treatment methods normally have a very good effect. This is what you normally see after a, after a treatment. But uh, some of the methods can be quite stressful. And uh, that's not surprising. The fish are crowded, pumped, subjected to uh, some sort of uh, physical or thermal treatment, and then uh, released. Very stressful. And uh, they can have unwanted side effects. For instance, uh, use of hot water has been uh, demonstrated to uh, inflict pain in the fish. And uh, also uh, these mechanical treatments can in some cases uh, lead to skin uh, damages if they are not correctly uh, adjusted or if uh, the fish is in a poor condition when they are uh, treated. And they are expensive, very expensive. Because of the large uh, use of, uh, of uh, equipment needed to perform these treatments. So, sea lice control, that is quite challenging for the fish health professionals. They have to choose between the different uh, methods to use, and they have to balance all the input from uh, all sides from the wild fish interest, from the environmental organization. Of course, uh, what's uh, the case in the, in the farm, are there any damages by the parasites? Uh, they have to comply with, uh, with uh, the regulations. Uh, they have to consider the economy in uh, the treatments, uh, environmental effects, and the deal with resistance. So uh, the fish health professional who have to do the day-to-day decisions about how to approach the problem, they really do not have an easy job. So what can we see for the future in the crystal ball? 
Well, uh, I don't think we will ever return to a situation when uh, medicinal treatments uh, are, are the main option for uh, treating sea lice. Uh, that uh, time period has passed, uh, I think. Uh, but uh, medicinal treatments will not be ruled out. I think for a long time uh, they will be used as a supplement uh, to other types of treatment because there are situations where uh, actually from a, uh, from a fish welfare point of view there is really not much of an op option to use uh, the medicinal uh, compounds because in general they are more gentle to the fish than the rather uh, uh, blunt and uh, uh, quite uh, stressful uh, physical treatments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Horsberg. Now let me just remind the viewers to send in your comments or questions online using the Q&A section on the right-hand side of the live feed. You also have the opportunity to participate by taking a look at the questions already submitted and clicking thumbs up to any question you might find interesting. This will enable us to make sure that the most popular ones are included during the Q&A session uh, at the end of today. Also, you will see a button on the top right corner of your screen called Polls. Please click here right after the conference and fill in the short questionnaire. It's a brief but valuable tool for the organizers so we can assess the uh, success of the conference, the topics, presentations, and the conference in general. Our next speaker is Professor uh, Ross Houston from the University of Edinburgh. Ross Houston is a uh, personal chair of aquaculture genetics and the deputy director for translation and commercialization at the Roslyn Institute. His research team focuses on genetics and genome editing technologies in aquaculture species, including genomic selection for commercially relevant traits and breeding programs with a focus on disease resistance and the application of CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing for pinpointing functional disease resistance, resistance alleles. Today, he will be talking about genetic selection, the ultimate green approach. Ross. Hello, my name is Ross Houston, and it's my pleasure to talk to you briefly today about genetic selection, the ultimate green approach. As we know, effective control of sea lice in Atlantic salmon farming requires a multifaceted approach. Some treatments can be costly or have environmental or animal welfare concerns. Selective breeding for host resistance can offer cumulative and permanent improvement. So the question we're asking today is what role do breeding and genetics have to play in preventing sea lice infestation? Typically, genetic resistance to sea lice is assessed using experimental challenge models or sampling of natural outbreaks. In the experimental challenge model, a naive population of salmon is given a copepodid challenge and the main target trait measured is individual sea lice counts on the fish. A key factor in determining how much genetic progress can be made for any target trait is the heritability, which is essentially the proportion of variation in the trait that's due to genetic factors. Across many studies depicted on the table on the right, it's been shown that sea lice resistance as measured by lice counts on the fish or lice density is heritable, with the average heritability being 0.22, implying that genetic progress and genetic improvement can be made for this trait. That can be achieved through family selection, which has been done in, in Atlantic salmon breeding programs for some time. The high fecundity of, of the fish is utilized such that full siblings of the selection candidates can be given a disease challenge, for example, a sea lice challenge, and those data are used to calculate family level breeding values to inform which individuals and which families to choose for mating for the next generation. And you can imagine that the sort of data that can be used for that purpose are depicted in the figure on the right, where there's a distribution of sea lice counts according to family. So how can genetic marker information or SNP chips help that process? Well, while family selection uses average relationships between individuals, the actual relationship between individuals varies substantially. For example, you can see there in the graph on the left, that the actual relationship uh, or realized genetic relationship for full siblings while the average is 0 0.5, the actual relationship varies substantially around that amount. So with that, 
family selection, it's possible to select the most resistant families using pedigree records and using knowledge of which families on average are the most resistant. But we need to consider this within family genetic variation. We also need to consider the genetic diversity of the breeding population and the fact that sea lice is not the only target trait and multiple traits are targeted for improvement. So with genomic selection, it allows this line here to be change so that it becomes horizontal and instead of focusing on families it's possible to select the most resistant individuals and that captures both within family variation and between family variation and allows for maintenance of increased genetic diversity while also increasing the selection intensity that's placed on the trait. So how well does genomic selection for lice resistance perform? Well we did a study a while back where we tested the, the efficacy of genomic data for predicting breeding values this was based on a sea lice challenge on a pedigreed population of Lancatch strain fish. They were challenged with 96 larvae per fish, and they were sampled at seven days post-infection in genotypes and individual lice counts were taken. We found that sea lice resistance is a very polygenic trait controlled by many loci of minor effect underlying the genetic resistance. And we assessed the genomic prediction by looking at a, a term called accuracy, which is approximately the correlation between the predicted and the true trait values for masked fish. And this is scaled for heritability because what we're actually interested in is the correlation with the true breeding value, which is, which is unknown. So here, all animals are measured for sea lice counts and have SNP chip information, but we mask the phenotypes or sea lice counts of subsets of the population and ask how well can we predict those uh, trait measurements using the genomic data alone. And what we found is that genomic prediction significantly outperform, outperforms pedigree based prediction as depicted there in the figure. And also that when we reduced the SNP marker density, it didn't have a huge impact on this ability of genomic prediction. So relatively low marker density is sufficient. So that works well and has been widely applied in salmon breeding programs globally, but where is the field heading? So sea lice counts have been largely used, but I think there's there's a lot of scope for developing more effective target trait measurements and, and different target trait measurements and recording those traits. And that includes automated trait recording and artificial intelligence and different trait measurements on the individual fish, such as biomarkers of host response, lice reproduction traits um, and mucus composition traits, for example. An interesting preprint was uh, came online just recently, which looked at genetic variation in salmon uh, chiromones and the effect that, that has on resistance to sea lice infectivity. Also optimizing genomic selection to improve cost efficiency and prediction accuracy, that could be via reducing genotyping cost and efficiency or improving the accuracy of prediction using functional genomic data. I'll talk briefly about both of those. And finally, genome editing for resistance to sea lice by making targeted changes to key genes linked to host response and genetic resistance. And I'll also talk briefly about that. Whole genome sequence data for populations of breeding programs uh, fish is now becoming feasible, but is relatively expensive. Imputation is an approach that can improve the cost efficiency of this by sequencing key individuals, for example, the parents, and genotyping others at low density or, and, and cost. And this is depicted in, in the diagram here, where the two parents are sequenced. The sequence information is used to define the haplotype segregating within the parental population such that when offspring only have low density genotypes, it's possible to work out which of the parental haplotypes they're carrying and impute their genotypes up to the level of whole genome sequence. And that allows for higher resolution genetic studies, for example, for the discovery of functional variants, as opposed to using the linked markers that are typically available on SNP chips used widely today. And why is that useful? Well, it can be used for identifying and prioritizing functional variants to improve prediction accuracy. For example, by combining genome-wide association data with functional genomics, by comparing the gene expression response uh, of resistant and susceptible salmon. And this allows for QTL regions in the genome that can be identified by large populations of salmon uh, with trait information to be looked at in more detail, such that variants within those regions can be annotated according to their predicted impact on a gene and whether that gene has evidence for differential expression between resistant and susceptible fish. And that could be used for improving genomic selection models by applying differential weighting on putative functional variants. 
This may, might result in improved accuracy, but also improved persistency of accuracy across more distant variant, uh, animals. And finally, looking at future directions and breeding for disease resistance, genome editing for resistance could be a potential game changer. There's now major Norwegian, UK and international consortia projects which have begun recently focused on understanding differential resistance between resistant and susceptible animals within a population and between resistant and susceptible salmonid species, and then applying CRISPR editing to increase resistance. So here depicted on the left is the a well-known fact that coho salmon are relatively sea lice resistant, whereas Atlantic salmon are relatively susceptible. And in these projects, a lot of focus is being made on the early stages post-infestation on how coho salmon can reject the sea lice and why Atlantic salmon can. And that's looking in detail at, at different cell types using single cell RNA-seq and also looking at uh, high resolution proteomics, including protein-protein interactions. Those data will be used to identify high priority genes and pathways for CRISPR editing of target loci in Atlantic salmon, asking the question of can the mechanisms of resistance to sea lice be transferred from, from more resistant to more, uh, uh, more susceptible salmonid fish. And finally, I'd just like to thank everyone that's been involved in these studies and uh, has contributed to the data and studies that I've, I've presented today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ross Houston, for your presentation. We have now reached the uh, final presentation in this Sea Lice Online Conference. Um, I will bring you back to Norway, this time to uh, Trondheim, where we will meet Kjell Maroni. He's uh, the last decade been the research director of aquaculture, aquaculture at the Norwegian Seafood Research Fund. And before that, we know him as director of the uh, Sjömat Norge, the Norwegian Seafood Federation for, for also about 10 years. Um, I understand, Kjell, you are with us online from Trondheim. And I understand... Mm -hmm. hey. Hello, Kjell, welcome to the Ferros. Thank you. Um, I understand that you will bring in some of the points made in the previous uh, presentation to these conferences. We are looking forward to hear you. The screen is yours. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I was asked to uh, try to look a bit ahead, visions for a sustainable future. That's uh, difficult. So I uh, went to the sources. Anybody know what this is? Probably not. <clears throat> this is the Art of War by Sun Tzu, Master Sun, from the 5th century before Christ. And when I, I haven't read it in uh, Chinese, but I've looked a bit uh, about, about it. And I think this is very similar to what we are uh, doing when we fight and have war with the uh, salmon lice. It's important to lay plans. We initiate the battle, plan attacks, have tactical dispositions. We discuss about the use of energy. We try to find weak and strong points. <clears throat> we try to maneuver, uh, maybe a variation in tactics, coming back to that. Uh, situational positioning, look at the modeling and spread of lies. The nine situations, I uh, don't go into that. But, and then really attack by fire. Maybe something uh, what uh, Torainar was talking about when you have strong medicines. And also the use of spice. Where on earth are all these sea lice larvae? Where do they come from? How do they come? And so on. So uh, I found it uh, interesting because we are fighting a very, very clever enemy. My background is as a biologist. Uh, I got some pictures from Aina Övegård from uh, IMR of the sea lice, and I, I get more and more impressed. How on earth has this parasite managed to develop their natural life cycle that Kjetil was talking a little about? 
finding his molds, going out into the ocean, uh, maybe to the Faroes from Norway, coming back and complete their li life cycle. And they are very, very clever at the resistance development. They can adapt variation of uh, resistance in a way. And you have the survival of the fittest. So we fight a very clever enemy. Uh, fish welfare must be the winner, in my opinion. And I know that Kjetil is very, very much in agreement there. And we start getting these questions. Have you been battering fish, your fish? So that must be a key into the future. We must take care of the fish, be it salmon or be it uh, cleaner fish. Uh, one option we have is to minimize the contact between parasite and host. If the lice don't find the salmon, they don't have very much ability to develop resistance. Maybe we can have a selection of uh, deep swimming uh, copepodites and so on, but uh, I find that maybe uh, biologically difficult. But there are some articles showing that it might happen. So we have mini skirts. We can have uh, flying fish, but we bring the fish uh, out of the environment where the lice are. Maybe a uh, better picture is uh, the uh, land-based or closed uh, containment. Fast growth. If you can ensure that the salmon grow fast, we have a shorter exposure period. Snorkel cages and similar underwater cages that can prevent the salmon from, not the shark, but from the lice. I think this is a very good strategy, but also difficult and costly. And, uh, but most of these is also taking very well care of the uh, welfare of the salmon. And then we have other methods to create a non-attractive host, a non-attractive salmon. It could be, it could be like the orienteering runner here that can't find where it is going. Uh, maybe we, uh, uh, similar in uh, salmon would be that uh, the salmon can't detect the no the lice can't detect the, uh, the salmon because it's uh, the wrong smell or something like that. You can see and we have heard about uh, methods where the uh, lice is kind of eaten by the immune system of the the salmon. Very welcome, but I'll kill you. And we have what I've put in here, the DNA technology way, where, where many tools are under development. Long shots, probably, but uh, genetics uh, selection, or maybe also vaccine uh, roads, vaccine-like things, are being developed and tested. But uh, as I say, it's, it's a long way. Uh, we could have uh, something in the feed that makes uh, the uh, host non-attractive. Uh, doesn't seem to be very efficient, but uh, small help. Or we could have something like this, uh, where uh, the salmon are kind of toxic to the uh, to the lice. So, but all these methods will be counter attacked by the uh, lice by adaption or uh, resistance development. So I strongly believe in control method rotation. And I think that at least in Norway, I think also other countries do some big mistakes here. We've heard about following from what Kjetil was talking about and also others, that's important. But it's also important to have a circle like this around the, the sun, where, in my opinion, you use one method, only one per once per production cycle. That will make it much more difficult for the parasite to adapt, for instance, to temperature. So, and I see, Big uh, de boats being built now 
big investments and since the farmers have invested so much in these boats they tend to use only thermalizer only mechanical dealizing maybe not that much only fresh water but we have to be better at uh, that because the lies will adapt we have proof of it um, and i think we need to into the future have no toxic chemical emission these fish do not use the water for three days uh, tell this is from a river but of course the live uh, wild fish and uh, other animals are there and they of course they can escape but we see effects that i wouldn't believe and didn't believe some years back when it comes to for instance uh, effect of uh, hydrogen peroxide in the environment and we tend to blame others it's much more pollution from other sources and it wasn't me i didn't do it and so on uh, but this is uh, something you have to ha take really seriously and it's very promising to see new methods coming up where the uh, effluent from uh, medicinal treatment is really treated well but we also have to treat the effluent when we use thermal or mechanical uh, methods we have to take care of all of all the lice that falls off the, off the fish and also the lice that falls off the fish when we start to crowd the fish when uh, for slaughtering or for delicing because uh, we know that lots of lice falls off that's another uh, place where we are not good enough uh, my view vision for the future is that we can come to this situation we don't have any output of fit sea lice larvae from farmed salmon maybe we have some lice that find the salmon but we have developed methods vaccines feed ingredients or other methods so that the lice larvae that are um, hatched or escape say it that way from the farm they don't survive in the environment if you can manage that that would be a, a long-term solution probably so with that thank you for listening if at least the ones of you that know norwegian if you go into our web page we have a, an area where all the sea lice salmon lice projects that FF, FHF has been involved in over the last 10 years at least are presented and uh, I think you can find lots of knowledge there so thank you for listening thank you very much Chell for a thought-provoking presentation I think your insights and on the challenges and possibilities that lay before us it was the perfect conclusion to the past three days of excellent uh, presentations. We now end our session that was focused on expanding options for integrated pest management, improved tools for a sustainable future. And in a few minutes, we will have all five presenters join us on Zoom for the Q&A session. But before the Q&A begins, the Sea Lice online conference would like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsors. This conference would not be possible without their support and sponsorship. First, the company sponsoring 10-minute presentations. Benchmark Animal Health, Hidden Fjord, and now the company sponsoring 5-minute presentations. Bakkefrost, Ilonko Animal Health, and Mowi, as well as our additional sponsors. The Municipality of Torshan, and the Torshan Evening School. We're just waiting now for a moment to make sure that all of the speakers are with us, um, and once that is um, all set, then we'll begin the, uh, the Q&A. So now would be a good time, if you haven't, uh, to go in and give a thumbs up to some of the questions that you, uh, um, you might have found interesting 
or to ask some questions uh, that you haven't had the possibility to do yet. We we'll just have a minute now to uh, connect yep. to all the speakers. We're getting messages that they are almost ready, so they should be with us in, uh, in just a moment. So we have 22 questions so far that are online. Yep. yep. And we're just waiting uh, just a moment longer. So there's 22 questions I can see uh, now that have been asked. So that's a, that should give us a nice uh, Q&A session. So again, it's, right. a, it's a really nice system to be able to like questions um, uh, that might have already been asked. Perfect. Hi, welcome uh, back. Thank you, welcome back, all of you. Um, Would you like to uh, take the first one? Yeah. Yes, I can take it. Um, the first uh, question, I think, addressed to the first speaker, Chetel. Uh, so, uh, some people would like to know if the system you're suggesting, if uh, it's possible to raise one million salmon per farm to full size uh, using any of these options you are presenting. Uh, Chetl, or you. could you hear me? Perhaps you're muted. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sure. Yes. While we wait for uh, the logistics to be worked out uh, to get Chetl in line for the question, uh, we uh, we have another question for Chandar. Uh, and the question is, what's the largest uncertainty in your sea louse model? Can you hear me, Chandar? Uh, yes, yeah. I can hear you. Uh, well, it's, uh, there are, of course, a lot of uncertainties in such a complex and large model. Uh, and it depends on what, uh, what sort of system you're looking at. If you just take the examples I have from Fairwands, where apparently it was enough to have constant internal infection and external infection, plus the, relative, the course temperature uh, are, throughout the year uh, in Faroe Islands, then the largest uncertainty was the efficiency of treatments, which you need to fit uh, to the lice counts, which in them, themselves bear some uncertainty. So uh, in that sense, treatment efficiency and, and lice counts are, are the largest uncertainty to, to validate and, and uh, run such a model. Uh, thank you, Trante. Chetel, uh, you are with us now. Can you hear us? Thank you. Uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I hope? Uh, yes, yeah. just please hear you loud and clearly. <laughs> um, there are some uh, people who like to know if your system you're present, uh, presenting, if it's possible to raise, uh, suggest one million salmon per farm in full size. Would that be uh, possible, you think, in the near future? I think it would be possible. We haven't done that so far, but. Uh, uh, it should be possible. Uh, we are doing. We have established a company called Atlantis uh, Subsea Farming together with Aqua Group, and uh, uh, there we have um, Trude Olafsen. She is in charge of, of that company and uh, in charge of the testing that we are doing with uh, with the Atlantis uh, model. I'm quite sure that she will provide any information that you need on the possible um, scale of the production. But our intention is to equip uh, full sites with uh, with these solutions where it's relevant to use it. We have another question for you uh, while you're um, while you're in the seat. Are there additional costs associated with these systems, such as uh, power costs or logistics? Of course, we have some additional costs now in the testing uh, phase that we are in. But um, when we have um, done the necessary investments, we see benefits from, from the solutions. From when we submerge the, uh, the net and the cages, we see that it's possible to keep the fish uh, uh, down uh, at uh, sea levels, uh, maybe 15, 20, 25 meters uh, below sea level. That means that we don't have to handle the fish. We, don't, we have to control the sea lice and, and do the sea lice counting. 
uh, with optimal uh, solutions. And the benefit, we also have uh, um, um, water feeding. So we have more benefits than disadvantages with the, with the system. So in total, I think that we we will have uh, fish that grow faster uh, with more welfare uh, feasible uh, behavior. And that will end up with uh, um, total cost in, in favor of these solutions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chad. Uh, it's a question to try, and I think also Chell touched on it, is the intensity of treatment. Do you think that will uh, uh, affect the uh, the lice limits we are implementing. I think you are down to 0.1 in uh, Norway and we are uh, a little bit higher here in the Faroes. Maybe that uh, related to the intensity of treatment. Um, well, I'm not 100% uh, that I understood uh, uh, the question cor uh, correctly, but uh, of course the lice levels, uh, if they are lowered, uh, that would, if you are depending on uh, on uh, these uh, chemical treatments, you need to uh, you need to do more treatments, but. Uh, uh, the point is, uh, in Norway, that was not the reason why we had such an increase in the use of uh, additional product, because uh, from uh, 2012, there hasn't uh, been any uh, major adjustments in the, in the life level uh, allowed. Uh, it's been uh, 0 0.5 adult females for most of the year and 0 0.2 during the spring. Uh, before that, uh, and the, the level shouldn't be exceeded. Uh, before that, uh, it was uh, mandatory for the farms to, to do, uh, to treat when they were exceeded. So a slight change has been, but uh, I don't think uh, that's a major uh, issue here. I'd like to comment a bit on that because uh, in a way I'm coming back to my uh, vision for the future, no uh, surviving uh, functional larvae coming out from uh, farmed salmon. And uh, I've come to the, I have the opinion that it's important to keep the numbers as low as possible at all times because you the uh, lice uh, reinfestate your own fish and are spread uh, through surprisingly long distances, probably especially when you have low water temperature and it takes a long time before the larvae burns out. So uh, my opinion is that if everyone managed to keep 0 0.1 or maybe even lower uh, lice uh, numbers, we would uh, reduce the uh, amount of uh, treatment needed. Excuse me, could I also add something uh, regarding these uh, lice limits? Because in Norway, we have, since I was working in the Norwegian Seafood Federation with the Sea Lice Project, we have had discussions with the Norwegian Competent Authority, uh, um, Matilsyne. And uh, we know that there are no scientific uh, uh, documentation creating the basis for this uh, for the lice limits that we have in the regional uh, regulations. So that's basically a bureaucratic uh, uh, limit or limits because we have lower limits uh, during the the spring. So I completely agree with Shell that it's important that we uh, define our own uh, um, reaction limits. Uh, where we where we put the uh, proper uh, um, measures uh, uh, into effect in order to to keep the levels as low as possible uh, throughout the year and throughout throughout the production. I'd like to follow a bit on that because this is very interesting. Uh, in your model, uh, Ronde, if you have say ten sites. Everyone kept 0 0.05 uh, mature females, and one had five. Uh, I've seen some uh, modeling on that, and that one site only, maybe with a few cages, 
destroy all the sea lice uh, war for the others. So uh, it's I think it's important that everyone keeps low. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we did some research on in uh, a modeling uh, sort of setup where we had five farms infecting each other. And if you do decide to go have a low treatment threshold and one just keeps on high treatment threshold, all the other farms sort of treat for this one farm. And overall, this is uh, very inefficient also in the amount of treatments and how much uh, money you spent on, on keeping a low lice number. But that, that's also based on uh, sort of this uh, stor what Stormon and, and them have uh, sort, of, sort of researched, the Alea effect. So if we have really no low numbers, the difficulty of find mates finding each other can sort of uh, play a positive role in, in, in how many larvae a farm produces if you manage to get to a really low uh, uh, amount of lice. Thank you. That was a, a really good discussion on, uh, on the lice modeling. Um, we have a qu question for Ross now. Uh, so CRISPR is obviously an exciting technology, but what do you think are the implications um, uh, for the market? Will they be considered GMO products, or how do you see that playing out? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, at the moment, of course, CRISPR is primarily a, a research tool and a very valuable one to understand the biology of um, post-response and genetic resistance. But um, indeed, it has potential applications in the field in the future. And then um, the question of whether uh, if uh, a, a gene-edited salmon would be considered a GMO uh, is unanswered as yet. And I think it's a basis for active discussion. Um, the major... Um, uh, uh, so, yes, so Norway and, and the UK are, are not necessarily going to, to have to go down the same line uh, as Europe in that situation. Um, and there's an opportunity to uh, define sort of um, uh, country specific um, regulations there. But important in that is having open dialogue, uh, both with um, regulators and also public to um, to make informed choices. Um, the other point just uh, finally to make is that um, when we consider the use of genome editing technology in uh, fish production, there's already some countries around the world that have allowed it. For example, uh, an isle tilapia in Argentina and a red sea bream uh, in Japan or close to it. Um, those are both for fillet, um, improved fillet content. Here we have a trait that um, if it's successful and we manage to find the right target for editing, and that's the big um, that's the big challenge. If we manage to find the right target for editing, here we have a trait that if genome editing is able to solve the problem, then it has huge um, animal welfare, economic and environmental benefits. So when you consider it in a cost uh, uh, benefit or cost risk framework, it looks very attractive, I think. I, have a, I actually have a question for you about that. Do you see um, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology maybe having uh, some use somewhere else in the value chain, such as adding, uh, manipulating the uh, different food additives and things of that nature? Yes, possibly uh, via, via sort of microorganism yeah. Um, uh, modification, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have much to add to that, though. Yes, yes, potentially, but I think um, not there. I yet. haven't thought about that in the context of sea lice uh, um, resistance. Thank can, you. I, can I comment on that also? Yeah. <laughs> um, FHF is funding uh, one big project on trying to uncover the mechanisms why some Pacific salmon uh, are. Uh, uneatable to say it that way for uh, or non-attractive to our uh, salmon lice and our uh, opinion on uh, CRISPR and similar tools today is that they're extremely important scientific tools but uh, so far only as for scientific uh, science and 
trying to uncover the mechanisms because I wouldn't be surprised if we find the same mechanisms lying in the genes of the Atlantic salmon. And maybe if we know exactly where to pinpoint, we can uh, enhance the natural breeding programs uh, without necessarily doing uh, gene modifications. So I think we should be very, yeah. very careful uh, now on uh, it is a it is a scientific, uh, very, very valuable and strong uh, tool and keep it at that so far. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one of the hot issues now is actually the climate change, also in other fora than in aquaculture. Um, uh, and I wonder a bit, the some other question are how will the change of temperature or increase in temperature affect the sea situation and future uh, treatments? But maybe start with you, Trenter. Uh, what's the effect of changing temperature in the, in the when you're modeling the sea lice, number of sea lice, and uh, the effect of your treatment in your model? Hi, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, well, we haven't done any specific work on what, how uh, an increase of, say, two temperature, uh, two degrees temperature affects. Uh, a system uh, uh, or a network of farms. Uh, maybe you could ask, uh, Sandvik had put an article about this, uh, I think recently. So maybe she, she has more uh, concrete, let's say, um, uh, a concrete answer to that question. But I can say from, we have, of course, tried to manipulate the temperature and our model is very flexible in that sense. And if you increase the temperature with two degrees, it just makes everything go faster. So the development stages or the stages are shorter and the females produce more larvae, which it just increases uh, the population growth rate overall. So that's uh, the, the overall non not specific answer. But uh, <clears throat> at the same time, when you have high sea temperatures, the, again, the larvae will uh, survive for a shorter time. And we, we have seen, at least in Norway, when we have very rarely very good summers, that uh, that affects the uh, lice numbers also, that they, they don't thrive that well in the high temperature. That doesn't uh, the salmon either, but they uh, go deeper in the water at that time. That is true. That is, uh, of course, a a relevant point and if we manage to somehow or if we manage to couple this hydrodynamic model with a, a symbolized model you could maybe more uh, in a bigger detail answers questions like this so uh, yes the temperature goes higher and that will affect the dispersion pattern of uh, mm. larvae which can affect how it spreads uh, through no, uh, fjords and, and uh, farm networks yes mm. I think the article on that uh, on the Sunweek presented, uh, they didn't really give a good answer. It's so complicated. So we <laughs> yeah. don't know. <laughs> Thanks. And I think we have time for just uh, one or two more questions. Uh, we have one question for Tor again. Any thoughts on the introduction of, uh, I don't have my glasses on, a neonicotinoid uh, into the aquaculture as a medication, I, I presume? Oh, I have uh, several thoughts. Uh, <laughs> the, the thing is, uh, neonicotinoids are not uh, looked upon with uh, uh, as a very environmental friendly compounds uh, used on uh, terrestrial pests. Uh, because uh, it's been demonstrated that they have a quite significant uh, effect on uh, bees, as you know. Uh, and uh, they have a fairly uh, they are quite toxic to a number of uh, organisms. So, uh, but the reason that they have been approved in Norway is uh, uh, because of this clean, uh, uh, clean treat system by uh, Benchmark, where they are basically at least claiming not to release any of the active compounds, but uh, rinse it out before the effluents are, uh, are done. Uh, the, thing is, uh, we know from previous projects that we have run that they are very effective uh, against sea lice. We did uh, a couple of projects uh, actually several uh, years ago, and uh, they are very effective. 
but uh, do not think that uh, they will last forever, even with uh, with uh, this system of uh, cleaning the effluents and uh, not releasing uh, uh, dead parasites uh, out to the sea. They will be uh, prone to, the parasites will be able to develop resistance towards them at the end. You may prolong that period by correct handling of them and not overusing them. So uh, yes, I have uh, I have some some thoughts uh, about it, and uh, the thing with them uh, when it comes to resistant development, one we are in a much 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 better situation today than uh, we were when the last chemicals were introduced because we have already developed uh, monitoring methods uh, via biases. We have the genome fully sequenced. We know the genes that are uh, that may be affected and uh, may uh, get mutations. Uh, we have them sequenced. We have assays to to run them. So, uh, so uh, if done correctly, this period before a potential resistance uh, emerges can be delayed uh, quite a bit. Uh, thank you very much. We have time for a short question. I may if you um, um, make it very short. Uh, some of the, some of the questions are wondering what is you are seen as the most innovative approach for loss control for the future. So, in very short, what is your bet on that? Maybe we we'll can start with you, Dr. Ross. What do you think is the most innovative um, approach we'll see in the future? Um, I, I think um, genome editing for for improved resistance uh, is 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 a very promising approach. Um, and as mentioned, the the intriguing possibility of transferring mechanisms of complete resistance from Pacific salmon species like coho, certain Pacific salmon species like coho salmon, over to Atlantic. The potential is very exciting, very large. The um, and with the caveats that we discussed, but I still think it's a very, very promising approach to start with the host genetics um, and prevention uh, via that route. Thank you. What do you see from a, a fish farmer point of view, Jatil? Uh, uh, of course, I, I strongly believe in our future. When we take into account, uh, for example, the, the um, uh, situation in the uh, Bindal fuel, where we have um, a salinity of approximately 22 ppm, uh, we aim at producing uh, um, fish there for 69 months without any sea lice at all. And then we, we move the fish to more exposed sites, uh, if necessary, with submerged uh, solutions. I'm quite sure that uh, together with uh, with breeding uh, uh, developments, uh, we will be it will be fully possible to produce a salmon without any reducing treatments. And if we, in addition to that, independent on what kind of uh, treatment that we need, we need to put that uh, treatment uh, into effect on the most optical or uh, correct uh, time uh, yeah, depending on the on the sea lice levels and the different stages not uh, uh, concentrating on any of the uh, public uh, requirements related to sea lice levels because that's uh, as i said uh, earlier it's a bureaucratic uh, uh, limit let us see from a, a pharmaceutical point of view uh, professor Horsberg, what do you see in that most promising for the future? Uh, not uh, new medicinal products. I don't, uh, I think they uh, will be uh, a good tool uh, to have available. And uh, there are certain situations where uh, they should be used, uh, especially when other methods uh, will fail due to fish welfare uh, issues. But uh, uh, in general, I think, uh, I think the time for one tool to be uh, the one that uh, that does the job uh, that time has passed it is an integrated approach with a number of uh, different efforts on a number of different uh, with all the tools available in the toolbox uh, uh, put in 
to uh, the control in the correct manner. And uh, it's a lot to do to find uh, what uh, to find the optimal sequence of uh, rotation of uh, of uh, control measures. Uh, between uh, them. So I think uh, the integrated approach is the future. Thank you. From model point of view, will you be able to include all this trend? Yes, yes, no problem. <laughs> uh, no, th that is, of course, really difficult. But from, uh, from what we've done, so sort of modeling wise, I think what will have a largest effect uh, is larger smolts. So if we Shorten the time that salmon are in in the, the sea, is in the sea. That will have by far the most effect on the overall life levels in in the fjords um, uh, and on the individual farms. Uh, as far as we see it, uh, when we do different model runs, yeah. Thank you, Trent. And from a overview and founding <laughs> point of view. <laughs> <laughs> what is your thought on this? Uh, I've been wor working with CLAS for 40 years, I realize. <laughs> but uh, no, I strongly agree with uh, actually both Ross and Torain, and all of you. But uh, <clears throat> I believe and I think we haven't found the, by far haven't found the optimized rotation uh, structure. <clears throat> because that will also differ from site to site, from probably from country to country. Uh, and we are not following uh, that book of war or tactics of war that I introduced uh, by really analyzing when do we put these strong attacks, maybe with the medicine, and when do we uh, use other uh, methods. We haven't really... Uh, dived into that optimization. Uh, and then I'd like to comment on a shorter production site uh, time in uh, CES. Yes, that means longer production uh, on land. Uh, of course, we have uh, closed containment systems both in sea and uh, on land, but they come uh, at a big cost. Uh, very, very difficult. Uh, to optimize and have a good uh, security. We see that from different cases, uh, but they will be part of the future for sure. And uh, must also be optimized to help in this war against sea lice. Perfect. But as a final comment, the worst sea lice attack I've ever seen was in the land-based farm in Norway in the 1990s. <clears throat> because they couldn't treat, they didn't get rid of the treatment water uh, quickly enough. So th that was really, really uh, bad, but uh, that was another technology. Perfect. Well, thank could, you. I'm afraid add, we're going to have to. Yeah. Excuse me. Could I add one important thing in my yes, opinion quickly. that I have not mentioned? And that is coordinated following. Uh, if possible, annual coordinated following in locally defined zones. We haven't seen the effect of that. I think it's a huge uh, option in. Uh, improving both welfare and the way we treat both the fish and handling the challenges with sea lice if we look more detailed into that uh, option. Thank you. That's Perfect. part of the total rotation, I think, and uh, optimizing that. Right. Thank you for those final comments. Unfortunately, we do have to uh, wrap up this, uh, this Q&A session now uh, due to the time. But thank you. Uh, for the conference mm. participants, for all your questions mm. and comments, and a big thank you to the presenters for sharing your uh, perspective and experience with us. Yeah, it was a really nice day, I think. I think we really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for your uh, time and effort and your very uh, good presentations, and finally, this good discussion. Thank you. Uh, now, as we mentioned earlier, we're uh, very, very <coughs> grateful to our sponsors. Um, and uh, we will now have our first sponsor presentation, which is from Benchmark Animal Health. Uh, so you'll be hearing a presentation on the field efficacy and safety of Ectostan vet against Caligos longotus, infecting Atlantic salmon. And it's going to be delivered to us uh, by veterinarian Peter Ostergaard. Yes, 
First of all, thank you very much for letting me give this presentation. My name is Peter Ostergaard. I'm a Danish veterinarian with more than 30 years of experience from the fish farming industry. I have the last 20 years been living and working in the Faroe Islands. I have my own private consultancy company, Aquamet, and I have been working together with Benchmark for some years now as an independent consultant. It has been a very big pleasure to work together with these skilled and dedicated people, and it has also been fantastic to see the new system for lice treatment, the clean treat, that Benchmark has introduced into Norway this summer as a commercially available uh, treatment solution. Uh, this presentation is on uh, the field efficacy and safety of Ectosan Vet, uh, a treatment against Caligus elongatus infecting Atlantic salmon. The agenda for this presentation is a short introduction, uh, something about the study design, the results, uh, efficacy, animal welfare, water quality, uh, dose maintenance, and of course, at least and last, conclusions. The introduction, the last years, in the last years we have seen problems with Caligus elongatus infections. We have seen it in most salmon producing countries, also here in the Faroes have we had big problems with this. Um, the Caligus elongatus is considerably less host specific than uh, the salmon lice, the Lepeftyrus salmonis, and adult life stages are considerably more mobile, which means that it allows the transfer between hosts. And we see that infections are more transient with rapid onset of infections, and that is making the prediction and the preventing and planning much harder. Husbandry techniques, as we use, like following uh, with very good effect on the salmon lice, has very little effect on Caligus. And of course, that's giving the wide range of host species that enters and leaves uh, into the farming areas from time to time. So, to handle this situation, it is, important, it is important to have as many tools available as possible in order to successfully implement a rotational strategy and to make it possible to prolong the lifetime of each treatment. The study was a GCP field trial conducted in Region 7, North Trøndelag, in Norway in autumn 2019. Uh, this trial included three production sites with total 23 pens treated over 32 treatments, which means that we had to split some of the pens. The size range of the fish in this study was between 0.75 kilos and up to 3.1, and temperature range was in the range of 12.5 to 14.7 degrees Celsius. Uh, inclusion criteria for the pens uh, was at least 0.2 adult lice per fish, and I must say that was the smallest of those problems we had during that trial. Lice count were performed at the following time points, pre-treatment within 24 hours before the treatment, and immediately post-treatment within 40, 24 hours as well after the treatment. Uh, we used quite a lot of time to count lice in the pre-treatments. Uh, one of the trials, I had uh, more than 2,000 lice in, in the sedation tank after the treatment, uh, after, before the treatment, of course. And the post-treatment count was much better because practically there were zero lice in those. The treatment water was uh, reused up to three times, which means that we had four treatments in uh, one treatment water portion. And we had um, continuously monitoring of water quality parameters and also monitoring the dose throughout the study. And uh, after treatment, all post-treatment water was purified with the clean treat system. And just to let you have an impression or if how to see this system works. We have a well boat and a, a clean treat vessel with the filter system. But we take the fish from the pen into the well boat, uh, make an accurate dosage of the uh, medicament, treat the fish, and we deliver the fish into a new pen 
via a dewatering system. And then we take new fish in and treat up to these four times, as mentioned before. And after the treatment, the well boat goes to the clean sheet vessel and uh, deloads the water into that one. And here, everything is um, rinsed, it's filtered uh, with the remo removal of organic matters. And then we start the clean treat process during, uh, through the filters. And before we discharge the water, everything is controlled with a, a dosage control to be sure that there are no medicament in the discharge water. And immediately before discharge, the purified water is run through a UV filter to minimize any kind of spread of pathogens. If we look at the results, you can see on the left side a lot of lice in different stages. We had a very good reduction, uh, total uh, efficacy on uh, adult sea lice, and um, you see a reduction in the calamus that might be due to the mechanical handling as well, but maybe we also see some efficacy here. When we look at animal welfare with uh, one of the most ultimate uh, parameters, mortality, we can see that there was no elevation of uh, mortality. We had a very low level mortality post-treatment. And I can say uh, I have seen a lot of these treatments. And when you monitor the fish and you look into the tanks via the cameras, you can see that the water gets a little bit blurry when we uh, add the ectosun, but you can't see anything on the fish. It is quite nice, calm, and, and it looks very beautiful. And also, later on in uh, post-treatment, <coughs> post the weekly mortality was very low still. <laughs> We had a lot of uh, measurements of the water quality, and as you can see, there was a slight increase of uh, CO2 during uh, the reuse uh, treatments. We ended up at uh, 14 milligram per liter at, at, uh, at last, but no problems with the water quality in total at all. So, um, in total, 40,480 cubic meter of treatment water was purified with the clean treat system accurately as planned. Also, the dose was maintained uh, quite good throughout the trial, and uh, we managed to keep us within the limit. The dose is 20 milligram per liter, and we uh, had that quite right. And in conclusions, we can say that uh, the Exosan VET treatment is very effective at removing infection with mobile stages of Caligus elongatus. It is a very safe lice treatment for Atlantic salmon. There are no safety impacts observed at all. Uh, we were able to use treatment water up to four times, and we managed to keep the treatment dose maintained within 10% of the target dose throughout the whole treatment. And uh, fish were exposed to a mean maximum exposure time of 168 minutes. A few times we had some problems uh, delivering the fish back into a pen, and uh, I have been there for, it was up to four hours uh, with the fish in the tank, and absolutely no problem still. The fish tolerate this very good. And regarding the clean treat system itself, uh, it showed suitable and effective to purify treatment water containing Ectosan VET. We delivered quite purified and clean water after the treatment. For more information, uh, please visit the Benchmark Animal Health homepage, bmkanimalhealth.com. You're also welcome to contact Carolina Farn. Lena Stocker or Beth Abelyard, and if you want, you can contact me as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter and Benchmark. The second sponsored presentation for today is from Alonco Aqua.
sea lice infestations are a major challenge to the sustainability of salmon production all around the world. New treatments, technologies and control strategies are evolving at pace in an effort to mitigate the negative impact of sea lice on fish appetite, growth, feed efficiency, welfare and mortality. With such a challenge, it is essential to adopt an integrated approach to improve control and protect the health, welfare and productivity of farmed marine species. Elanco have been trailblazing innovative pharmaceutical solutions that can fit together with other technologies in a multifaceted program delivering more effective, longer acting results. Driven by innovation, we are focused on developing new product formulations as well as novel application methods for our therapeutics and vaccines. At the heart of Elanco's approach is a desire to support our customers every step of the way with world leading technical support services that include histology, microbiology, and imaging services. Our vision is to find new ways to minimize the stress on farmed aquatic species by reducing fish handling, minimizing the requirement for treatment interventions, and improving how therapeutics and vaccines are tolerated. All these, along with environmental improvements, will positively impact fish health, feed efficiency, and growth, while reducing the management overhead of rearing quality aquaculture products in a more sustainable way. This is reinforced by what Alanco customers say about the evolution of better sea lice control and other health measures. Bueno, la, la innovación es un pilar fundamental para el desarrollo de nuevos productos que ayuden al control de problemas sanitarios en todas las especies animales. Y en la salmonicultura sí lo hemos visto que eh, el desarrollo con el desarrollo de productos innovadores tanto de productos farmacéuticos como vacunas, eh, se ha logrado mejorar de manera importante el control de estas patologías, tanto de Calibus en Chile como del SRS en, eh, en Chile también, permitiendo mejorar de manera eh, importante los indicadores de bienestar animal eh, y además de eh, lograr eh, tener un manejo más amigable con el medio ambiente, disminuyendo el uso de químicos y productos farmacéuticos en la industria de salmón. Hoy día la situación de cáligo de la industria está en una situación controlada, dado básicamente por eh, la aparición de productos antiparasitarios de larga acción, dado una coordinación estratégica de la industria y dado una rigurosa normativa y fiscalización por parte de Senapesca que respecto del, del control de la caligidosis eh, siempre hay espacios de mejora eh, que podemos ir eh, incorporando en, nuestro, en, en, nuestro, en nuestra estrategia de control de, de esta parasitosis y que ha permitido, junto eh, al soporte técnico de, de Lanco, nos ha permitido eh, mantener las cargas baj, bajas de parásitos en una etapa tan crítica como es los primeros meses en, en, al ingreso al agua de mar, en la etapa de Small, que es un, una etapa... Eh, crítica y muy importante para el desarrollo y crecimiento de, lo, de los peces. Y sin duda que el desarrollo de nuevos productos asociados a la innovación, nuevas formas de aplicación, nuevas drogas, asociados a la investigación en general de la industria, en conjunto con las universidades y centros de investigación, eh, son un aporte que eh, nos permiten aprender más sobre la parasitosis, aprender más sobre el control de, del cálibu, y lograr en conjunto obtener soluciones de manera integral para abordar esta enfermedad. What our customers say really counts, which is why the Alanco Aqua Team is highly proactive in developing strong cross-industry ties and contributing funding as well as specialist expertise to initiatives designed to advance sustainable sea lice control. Elanco are committed to the Global Salmon Initiative. In collaboration with the GSI, Elanco has been involved in a sea lice program that has delivered a positive impact on fish health, at the same time as reducing the number and frequency of sea baths required for effective control. At the Universidad Austral de Chile's research station in Puerto Montt, Chile, Elanco have been working closely with scientists on a bioassay model for monitoring the development of resistance to therapeutics in sea lice. This bioassay tool means that producers don't waste time and resources on treatments that are ineffective and that may contribute further to the development of resistance to sea lice treatments. Currently, Alanco are collaborating with our customers to monitor new approaches to improving sea lice control with the goal of increasing harvest yields, shortening the time to target weight and reducing the overall marginal cost of production to improve profitability. 
Recently, the Lanka's technical services team have launched Stage Manager, an online salmon health performance monitoring tool that also records the impact of sea lice infestations. Stage Manager tracks health and performance indicators at important production stages, from hatchery to harvest, with real-time health reports available online for sharing with the health management team. The whole driver behind Stage Manager is to optimise health management practices and to promote the performance of every salmon at every stage in every cycle. These are just some of the ways Alanco is working to support and improve customers' sea lice control success and to help secure the sustainability of salmon aquaculture as a consequence. Thank you, Benchmark and Alonco, for these informative and interesting presentations. So as our online conference is drawing to a close, the next item on our agenda is the 13th Sea Lice International Conference in Torshelm Faroe Islands. So we are aware that the COVID pandemic may still interfere with our plans, but we're optimistic that this situation will allow for hosting the in-person conference in May 2022. So until then, we will continue our pres uh, our um, preparations for the Great Sea Lice Conference reunion that we've all been waiting for. So please get your calendars out and reserve the dates now. 9th to the 13th of May 2022. De destination Torsoun, the Faroe Islands. Now please enjoy this short video, which is an invitation to you all. You will hear the year 2020 in the video, but please ignore those details. And just remember, the 9th to the 13th of May 2022. Welcome to the 13th Sea Lice Conference in the beautiful Faroe Islands. Fiske Island, the official conference host, is planning to give you a memorable and enjoyable conference and an unforgettable experience. The Sea Lice Conference represents a unique opportunity to interact with internationally renowned sea lice researchers and other stakeholder groups. The conference teams include sea lice biology, genetics, modeling, treatments, and fish welfare. You will also be able to experience the Faroese aquaculture industry firsthand with land-based aquaculture and inshore cage site visits arranged exclusively for the conference. Air travel to the Faroe Islands can be easily managed from several international hubs. Toshan is located 45 minutes from the airport. All hotels are less than 10 minutes away from the modern conference venue in the Nordic House. You can register for the conference on the Sea Lice 2020 website and keep up to date with the latest news on the official program, conference workshops, planned excursions and other topics of interest. Please keep an eye out for the early bird option and register for the update notifications. We look forward to seeing you in the Faroe Islands in 2020. Knut and Amanta for hosting this session and uh, like Amanta said you are all very very welcome to the 13 Sea Lice International Conference next year in Torshavn and as many uh, of you probably already know we have the website uh, sealiceconference.net I think it will come on, on the screen and uh, we will keep you updated with posts with relevant issues for uh, in connection with the conference. As we speak, you can register for the conference online. There are different options for early bird fee with applies for both standard tickets and for student tickets. You know it's been a while since the last Sea Lice conference, so it might be very a very good idea to register sooner rather than later. Another important detail is the abstract. Deadline for abstract is the 31st of December this year. I'm sure that the conclusion of this Sea Lice online conference should leave you with plenty of inspiration for abstracts. You know the word of Aristoteles, well begun is half done. So let's see this conference as a good beginning to the big conference in May 2022, where we all shall meet and greet each other but most importantly, present and discuss sea lice topics and issue. Again, we will be able to meet 
talk, ask, answer, and make network, and so on. The Faroe Islands will be waiting for you. Fiske Alink and the organizing committee are dedicated to put together the best possible conference pro program as possible. But please remember, the most ingredient of all to a successful sea life conference is you, the partic participants, presenter, and poster authors. We look forward to seeing you in Toshan next year. Now, in the light of the Sea Lies online conference of Tuesday, Wednesday, and today, I feel very assured that the Sea Lies community is well and strong. I'm impressed of the high quality presentations these three days. So, I want to thank every one of you who shared your expert knowledge in an inspiring manner. And to see all the questions from you viewers was a testament to the drive behind international research efforts. We didn't have time to address all the questions you sent. So this is another good reason to register for the conference next year. Thank you for all your participation. I think this conference demonstrates the most important of such events. We have had more than 800 individual registration for this conference alone. There is much to achieve as long as we manage to bring together our collective intellectual power. This is how we can cre create a real superpower of knowledge, as to speak. I'm so inspired today and I can't wait to see many of you here in May 2022. You will experience one of the smallest country in the world, but I promise you will be met with the warmth of our heart when you see us here. We have pre-booked hotel accommodation in a brand new in brand new hotels for you, and the conference center is the most fantastic center of its kind in the northern Europe, in our opinion at least. And we will show you our fjords and mountains and all the modern aquaculture installations that make up for the highly successful fish farming industry in the Faroe Islands. One final note. Please remember to press the poll button and let us know what you think about the Sea Lies online conference. It will help us making the 2022 Sea Lies conference as good as possible. Please look for up updates on our website, web page. And finally, I would like to thank all of you who made this conference possible. The excellent presenters, the technical staff here and at Fiskerling, the sponsor who make it pos made it possible for us to invest in good equipment and facilities, the organizing committee, the scientific committee, and the hosts, and of course you, the audience, the Sea Lies community. So I will leave you with these words. Next time in Toshan. Bye-bye. <laughs>